Well, good evening and welcome to the third talk on the subject of creation and evolution. The talks have been arranged by the Christians who meet at the Gospel Hall in Perth, Scotland. And the title of tonight's talk is The Making of a Man. According to the first chapter in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 and verses 26 to 27, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. The image of God. Quite a statement. You know, men and women, certainly in the UK, they would uh, welcome the plaudits of men. And every new year we have the honours list and some get knighthoods and uh, MBEs, OBEs and, and so on. And many fail to appreciate the high dignity that God has conferred upon every man and woman, every boy and girl on planet Earth. According to this verse in the Bible, all of us are made in the image of God. No cow in the field is made in the image of God. No ape in the jungle is made in the image of God. But every man and woman on planet Earth, according to Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27, all of us made in the image of God. Now, Michelangelo got it wrong in the painting, the imparting of life by the divine touch on the hand of Adam. Of course, the Bible says that God breathed into the nostrils of Adam and man became a living soul. I see it so clearly. I see Adam made from the dust of the earth, all of the organs, all of the vital parts, and yet lifeless until God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. I see his chest rising his eyes opening, and man becomes a living soul made in the image of God. Professor Steve Jones, a geneticist and evolutionary biologist, he wouldn't believe this. He said in the Learning Zone, BBC Two, some 17 years ago, we are something like 99% similar to the chimpanzees. After all, Gilbert and Sullivan, those great scientists, said, Darwinian man, though well behaved, is really but a monkey shaved. And of course, the chimpanzee would say, Gillette, the best a man can get. Is that all we are? Just a monkey shaved? Quite a difference between that statement and the one in Genesis chapter 1, each of us made in the image of God. Becoming human. We're all familiar with the iconic image, the progression, the evolution of man from some distant ape creature. And uh, th this icon, icon reigns today in most books on, on evolution. Uh, two little slides here. P. Schmidt says, fossils carry no labels. And the second slide, fossils are not in the position to answer back or wriggle in embarrassment at some wild interpretation of their meaning. And so this pathway from ape to man, we'll consider this discovery here. In 1908, in a gravel bed in Piltdown Farm, Sussex, UK, Charles Dawson, an amateur archaeologist together with Sir Arthur Keith, keeper of the geological department of the British Museum, and the Jesuit priest Pierre Teilhard uncovered some old-looking bones. They included part of a fossil skull, some teeth and part of a lower jaw. The jaw was broken at the part where it hinges with the cranium, and the jaw was ape-like, and the cranium was human-like, and it was hailed as a missing link and duly called the first Englishman. But he was actually made in England. And that's the artist's impression, how careful they are, based on the 
at the skull and the jawbone to create an image that is sort of halfway between man and ape. But as, as he himself has said here in the speech bubble made in England, the skull was shown to be a fake in 1951 when tests showed that the cranium and the jaw contained different proportions of fluoride. The cranium was that of a man and the jaw was from a modern orang Bhutan. The jaw had been coloured with potassium dichromate to give the appearance of age and the teeth had been filed down to resemble those of a human. And for 43 years, pilt down man, fooled the world. And the sad thing is, and the children swallowed the lie. Let's consider Nebraska man, a terrible toothache. Richard Milner in the Encyclopedia of Evolution, he writes of Nebraska man, one of the most singular and embarrassing incidents in the history of evolutionary science. In 1922, a solitary molar tooth was found in Nebraska. First rank paleontologists, anthropologists and anatomists examined the cusp pattern on the tooth and all agreed with the discoverer that the tooth belonged to an ancient ape man, a missing link of tremendous importance. He became known as Hesperopithecus, but Nebraska man to his wife and friends. And she suggested that he go and see the dentist. Distinguished English anatomist Sir Grafton Elliot Smith, he commissioned a painting which was given a two page spread in the illustrated London News. And the image there in the top right hand of, of the slide is just a part of that two page spread. It it showed Mr. and Mrs. Nebraska to be a well-muscled couple with sloping brows and all this based on a single tooth. In 1927, a team of paleontologists returned to the Nebraska site. To their joy, Weathering had exposed parts of a jaw and skeleton on the same spot. Eagerly, they brushed away the dust and sand until the ancient fossil emerged to tell its truth. The infamous smaller once belonged to an extinct pig. Luther Sunderland, he said this was the first time that a pig had made a monkey out of an evolutionist. You see, evolution, it happens in the minds of men. Remember what Rod Cade said? They're not in a position to, to answer back or wriggle in embarrassment at some wild interpretation of their meaning. In the case of Piltdown Man, it was open deceit and fraud. But in the case of Nebraska Man, well, it was just uh, a willingness on their part to see what they believed. Quotes to ponder. Roger Lewin in Bones of Contention he writes, the anonymous aphorism, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it, is a continuing truth of science. You know, we would normally say, uh, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. But here it's reversed and they say, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. See, really, it's worthy of the creative writing department. While browsing through a drawer containing primate fossils at Yale Museum, Elwyn Simmons came upon two upper jaw fragments collected from the Siwalik Hills in India in 1932. He concluded that they fitted together, forming a smooth U-shape. This suggested they were human-like as against ape-like, the V-shape. So, a U-shaped jaw, human. V-shaped, well, it was ape-like. He called his missing link Ramapithecus, meaning Rama's ape. 
1961, Simmons ran, uh, placed Ramapithecus at the root of the family tree and was supported by anthropologist David Pilbeam. Pilbeam suggested that Ramapithecus probably walked about on two legs, not four, used tools to prepare its food and hunted and had a social life more complex than any ape. You see, Pilbeam seen what he's believing. For more than 20 years, the myth of Ramapithecus reigned in evolutionary academic circles. In 1976, Pilbeam's team working in Pakistan unearthed, unearthed a new fossil of the creature. The jaw was complete and it had a clear V shape and not the human like U shape. Pilbeam went back to the original fossils and noticed that they could indeed be fitted together differently, giving the V shaped dental arch characteristic of the ape. When further fragments came to light, it was seen to resemble an ancestral orang utan. They are not in the position to answer back or wriggle in embarrassment at some wild interpretation of their meaning. Again, I would suggest to you that it's worthy of the creative writing department. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. David Pilbeam, Professor of Anthropology at Harvard University, must be a good age now. He said many evolutionary schemes are in fact dominated by theoretical assumptions that are largely divorced from data derived from fossils. We do not see things the way they are. We see them the way we are. Quite an admission. Quite an admission. We do not see things the way they are. We see them the way we are. According to the bias that we have, we all have a bias, but according to the bias, if you're absolutely convinced in that evolutionary pathway uh, to Homo sapiens, then, well, you interpret the data in the light uh, of that uh, worldview. Evolution, it happens in the minds of men. Dr. Arthur Jones, uh, he was interviewed on, on Radio Bristol and he makes this observation, the four stages. We've been through all this before. First, there is the hurrah stage led by the discoverers of the fossils. Next comes the yes, maybe stage when other scientists get involved in the evaluation. Usually this is followed by the no, maybe not stage. And finally, in many cases, the well, we had our doubts all along stage. The problem is, it's the first stage that gets all the headlines. Let's move off at a tangent here. Dr. Monty White, an article, billions of people in thousands of years. The global human population doubled between 1950 and 1987, going from 2.5 to 5 billion. So, uh, between 1950 and 1987, the world population doubled, doubled so in 37 years. It doubled between 1956 and 1994 from 2.8 uh, billion to 5.6 billion. And that's a period of 38 years. We are told that humans, modern Homo sapiens, have been around for approximately 100,000 to 200,000 years. Now let's be very conservative and let's assume that they haven't been around for these vast periods, 100,000, 200,000 years. Dr. Monty White says, let's assume that they've only been around for 50,000 years. So it's a very conservative figure. Again, let's be conservative and say that the population doubles every 150 years. 
not the 38 years mentioned on the previous slide. So if man has been around for 50,000 years and the population doubles, not every 38 years, but every 150 years, in the 50,000 years, we would get 332 doublings. So starting off with one man and one woman, and we would get 332 doublings, and it would give us this figure. We would give us a world population of 10 to the power of 99. Well, let's express it in more visual terms. That's what the world population would be if man has been on the planet for 50,000 years and the population doubles every 150 years. Now, I, I, all of those are nothing, so we, we tend to lose their significance. See, the present world population 2021 is approximately uh, 7.8 billion people. 7,800 million people. Let's round it up to the nearest 10. So that's what the present world population would be. You see, at the end of that red bar of colour, that zero there in the green, if we just had that number with those zeros, it would mean 10 times the present world population. But if we take that blue bar and from the one to that zero and the final, the final zero and that block of blue, that would be a million times the present world population. So when we get down to that final zero, the 99th zero, you know, it's just shouting out impossibility, impossibility, impossibility. Again, let's go off uh, at another tangent. Johann Mendel, I think he's called the father of uh, modern genetics. And mum and dad, Mr. Wolf and Mrs. Wolf. The female wolf provides the egg and the male wolf, he will provide the sperm. Of course, the egg has information in it and the sperm too has information in it. And when the sperm and the egg meet and the egg is fertilized, you've got combined information. And any offspring will be the result of that combined information. And so she has a, a number of offspring, five on this occasion, and they all are the product of that combined information in the fertilized egg. But you never get a dog with feathers. Now, why don't we, why don't we get dogs with feathers? Well, because there's no information in that fertilized egg for feathers. There's information for those pointy ears. There's information for the fur, but there's no information for feathers. So there are limitations to the, what can be produced from the various gene combinations. For instance, you think of the variation, the variety within the uh, dog uh, family, all sorts. And a logical consequence of Mendel's laws is that there are limits to such variation. All of these are dogs and all we've done is sh shuffle the, the gene pool, pool and perhaps through uh, selective breeding, uh, we have these various strains of the dog family. The top left-hand uh, dog is called a Bedlington Terrier, Bedlington being a village up in Northumberland, just about 30 miles away from my home here in Northeast England. There are definite limits to variation. See, no matter how much you shuffle the gene pool, you'll never get a dog with horns. It's impossible because there's no information 
within the dog gene pool, four horns. Abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is the belief that lifeless chemicals came together in ideal circumstances and created life. You know, when we go on out onto the uh, streets in, uh, in the towns uh, uh, here in the northeast of England and we go out to preach the gospel, we, we, we meet a variety of people, some who gladly confess that they're atheists and uh, I like to congratulate them on their faith and they tell me that uh, their position isn't a faith position, but I stress to them that it is a faith position. You say, I believe that God created life, but they believe that lifeless chemicals came together and created life. No scientist on the planet has ever seen lifeless chemicals combine and form life. It's never been witnessed because Abiogenesis has never been observed, never been observed. To the contrary, the only thing that has been observed, and that on a daily basis, is that living things only come from living things. And it's a, that is an established law in biology. It's called the law of biogenesis. But these people who, who confess to, be, to being atheists, they believe, so it is a faith position, that life has come from lifeless chemicals and that has never been observed. So therefore it is a faith position. We're surrounded by biogenesis. Every day in the maternity ward, a child is born, our children are born, life springing from life, mother and father. But let's imagine that lifeless chemicals did produce the first living cell. Let's, let's allow that leeway. But unless that first cell can self-replicate, it's dead in its tracks. So not only do you need the first cell, but also that cell must be able to reproduce itself. Otherwise, as we've said, it's dead in its tracks. It has to be able to self-replicate. Dr. Michael Denton, in his book, Evolutionary Theory in Crisis, the complexity of the simplest known type of cell is so great that it is impossible to accept that such an object could have been thrown together suddenly by some kind of freakish, vastly improbable event. He goes on to say, such an occurrence would be indistinguishable from a miracle. You know, they talk about a simple cell, but really, uh, in reality, there's no such thing as a simple cell. And he says, to, to suggest that that could come a, about by chance, well, it would be indistinguishable from a, a miracle. See, the first cell, every cell is loaded with uh, information. There's Mr. and Mrs. again, the wolf and Mr. and Mrs., let's say, Mendel. And uh, of course, they get together, the egg is fertilized, and you've got the information within the fertilized egg. Now you've got the, the, the fertilized egg of the wolf family, and you've got the fertilized egg of the human family, Mr. and Mrs. Mendel there. And of course, the offspring, the offspring is is limited it, it it has to conform to the information within the fertilized egg and so mr and mrs wolf produce wolves and mr and mrs human they produce a human offspring let's call her hilda and hilda is the result of the information within that fertilized egg and you and i uh, we we trace our uh, origin back to that time when the uh, our mother and father and the, and the egg and the sperm united and uh, and and so we began the pathway to becoming born. The resultant offspring is limited to the information in the fertilized egg. 
Evolution would have us believe that from that original first cell, life has slowly evolved, bringing us to the point where we have modern man. So this is what evolution teaches, that from that first cell, which had to be able to self-replicate, we have arrived in 2021 at modern man. Now, we said that the first cell would have information in it. But in this first cell, there's no information for, well, no information for muscles, no information for blood, no information for hair, no information for bone, no information for skin, and no information for the various organs that make up uh, the human body. And so to get from the first cell to modern man, who has all of these six things and more besides, there has to be a massive increase in, of information. Dr. James Allen, geneticist, he said the belief in amoeba, the first cell to man, evolution needs a huge amount of new genetic information. That's obvious, isn't it? We take a look at the first cell, there's no information within that first cell for hair, skin, organs, and so on. But to get a man, we need a massive increase of new genetic information. Lots of new information. You know, they tell us that our great, 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 great grandfather and lots more greats in there, that, well, we came from the sea. You know, you had a fish that, uh, who, who sprung limbs and uh, was able to venture onto the land. But we've made this clear in the previous talk that take the fish eye and the human eye. Vital difference, isn't there? We've got eyelids. So any fish venturing onto land without eyelids, well, uh, you would go blind. But it's one thing to have eyelids. Well, you need muscles to close the eyelids, eyelids and you need muscles to open the eyelids. And uh, underneath the eyelids, of course, within the human, there are tear glands and the wonderful chemical lysozyme. And then you need a network of nerves linking muscles and brain uh, together. And all of this, they tell us, happened. That massive increase of information, genetic information, they tell us that it, it happened, as we shall see, uh, over the alleged millions of years. New information. Ernst May, he writes, Ultimately, all variation is, of course, due to mutation. So getting from that first cell to modern man needs a massive increase of information and it's all brought about by mutation. Mutation. So all variation. So getting from no hair to hair, no bone to bone, no organs to organs, is all brought about, all this variation is brought about by mutation. Francisco Ayala writes, although mutation is the ultimate source of all genetic variation, it is a relatively rare event. Notice what he says, mutation is the ultimate source of all genetic variation. So the increase of information that takes us from the first cell to modern man 2021, it's all brought about by mutation. Mutation is the ultimate source of all genetic variation. Mutation. All. Well, what exactly is a mutation? 
mutations or mistakes in the copying process. Now we've said that uh, not only do you need the first cell, but that first cell needs to be self-replicating, has to be able to make a copy of itself. Mutations are mistakes in the copying process. Some examples. The typist had to type. The doctor told the patient to swallow two tablets every half hour. But the typist got it wrong. There was a mutation in her typing. And instead of typing, the doctor told the patient to swallow two tablets every half hour. She missed out the letter T. The doctor told the patient to swallow two tables every half hour. That was a mutation by deletion. So she's deleted the letter T. It's a mutation, it's a copying error, and it's made nonsense. That's life-threatening, not recommended to swallow tables. But then in that, later on that day in the afternoon, she's prone to errors. The typist had to type, Adrian's wardrobe was full of coats. But the typist made an error, she made a mutation. And instead of writing Adrian's wardrobe was full of coats, she typed Adrian's wardrobe was full of goats. It was a mutation by substitution. The C in coats had been substituted with a G and had turned coats into goats. It was a copy mistake. It was an error, a mutation. And then the next morning, I think she's very close to getting the sack by now, the critic was made to eat his words. But she got it wrong. The typist made an error, a mutation. And she wrote, the critic was made to eat his swords. So this is an error by insertion. She's not deleted a letter this time. She has added one letter. It's the letter, the letter S. And in the, in the adding of that word S, she's made words into swords. It is a mutation. Again, definitely not recommended. Now, each cell has intricate molecular machinery designed for accurately copying DNA, the genetic molecule. However, as in other copying processes, mistakes do occur, although not very often. It is estimated perhaps once in every 10,000 to 100,000 copies, a gene will contain a mistake. Some examples of visible and easily detectable genetic changes are, so these are mutations, cystic fibrosis, albinism, the albino, dwarfism, hemophilia, the blood uh, disease. These are mutations. Pierre-Paul Grasset, president of the French Academy of Sciences, he wrote, no matter how numerous they may be, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. W.R. Thompson, writing the introduction to the origin of species, the 1956 edition. In general, mutations are useless, detrimental or lethal. Dr. Lee Spetner, his particular ac academic prowess would be in information and communications. He wrote a book, Not By Chance. He says, in all the reading I've done in the life sciences literature, I've never found a mutation that added information. All point mutations that have been studied on the, on the molecular level 
turn out to reduce the genetic information and not to increase it. Now, don't forget to get from the first cell, self-replicating cell, to modern man 2021, there has to be a massive increase of genetic information. But Lee Spetner says, all point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not to increase it. Quite a statement. All point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not to increase it. Reduce it. The very opposite to what we require to get that from that first cell uh, to modern man we need an increase in information. And Lee Spetner says, well, uh, the, the studies show that it, it, mutations reduce the genetic information. I've never found a mutation that added information. He says the neo-Darwinian theory is supposed to explain how the information of life has been built up by evolution. The human genome has much more information than does the bacterial genome. Information cannot be built up by mutations that lose it. Let me illustrate it. In the top left hand corner, we have that, that graphic image that's meant to convey the, the, the first cell. As we said, it has information in it. I liken it to the note that my mother used to leave on the old glass milk bottle every morning. And if she needed extra milk, she would leave a note stuffed into the neck of the bottle. And it would say, four pints today, but none tomorrow. So that's, that's a limited amount of information. I liken it to that first cell. Now, there's a vast difference between the information on that note for the milkman than there is in Encyclopedia Britannica. Think of the massive increase of information. Well, getting the first cell to modern man, it needs an equivalent and even a greater amount of increase of information and all by copying mistakes. Well, we're entering the realm of fairy tales here, I would suggest. And all by typing errors. Information cannot be built up by mutations that lose it. A business cannot make money by losing it a little at a time. It's just plain common sense. Dr. Lane Les uh, Lester, writing in the magazine Creation Ex Nihilo, Creation Out of Nothing. Is there such a thing as a beneficial mutation? So is there a mutation? Is there, is there a copying mistake that is beneficial? And Dr. Lane Lester, uh, he gives one. Yes, there is. Darwin himself called attention to the wingless beetles on the island of Madeira. For a beetle living on a windy island, wings can be a definite disadvantage because creatures in flight are more likely to be blown into the sea. While this mutation, so there are beetles on the island that, that have no wings. While this mutation produces a drastic and beneficial change, in other words, the, the insects survive, it is important to notice that it involves loss of information. The beetle has lost the information for producing wings. One never observes the reverse occurring, namely wings sprouting being produced on creatures which never had the information to produce them. You see, the beetle that had the wings had wings because the information was in that fertilized egg. 
but a mutation has come into this beetle on the island of Madeira and the beetle has lost the information for creating wings. And so the offspring are born wingless. They survive. But notice, it is a loss of information. And here's another example. There is a very special sheep. It's the Dorset breed developed in, in southern England. Noted for its horns. They were medium in size and the ewes could give birth more than once a year. They always had horns. In some cases, the horns can even curve back towards the head and sometimes even grow into the head. But there was a useful mutation. In 1948 at North Carolina State College, USA, a lamb was born which did not develop horns. This was the result of a mutation which occurred in the purebred horned Dorset flock at the college. So the lamb was born without horns, even though it was the offspring of the horn variety of Dorset sheep. When the lamb grew up, it was used for breeding and eventually by artificial selection, a new breed was officially recognized in 1956. It was known as the Polled Dorset. And there's an image of a mature Polled Dorset ram. No horns on it. Those magnificent horns will not be found on the offspring produced by this one's parents. The horned Dorset sheep is now very rare in the USA. The mutation destroyed information in the gene necessary for horn growth. The mutation resulted in the loss of information. Dr. Jean Leitner, herself a veterinary uh, surgeon, she wrote an article and she says, what has virtually never been observed is a mutation that adds information like one growing horns on cats or dogs. So you never see that. Why not? Well, because there's no information within the fertilized egg for horns. But she, she finished her article by raising this question. If mutations don't add information, well, how did the information get there to begin with? So this is the pathway in the minds of the evolutionists, you know, the first self-replicating self cell, uh, fish uh, venturing onto land, becoming amphibians, amphibians becoming reptiles, reptiles becoming mammals, and uh, uh, mammals eventually turning into some ape-like creature that eventually would bring us over mi millions of years to uh, Albert Einstein himself. So we get from A to B, from the first cell to modern man, and it's all brought about this massive increase in information and all brought about by mutations. And remember what Dr. Lee Spetner said, I've never found a mutation that added information. And uh, I'm giving my age away here. And uh, I grew up with, uh, well, LPs, the old plastic L long playing records. And, but then we got into the 60s or thereabouts and we had uh, cassettes. And so I, I go along to the local music shop and I buy uh, my copy of Nigel Kennedy playing Four Seasons. And my next door neighbor, she says, can I make a copy uh, of the one that you've bought? And so she, she, she copies uh, my master copy. And then her mother wants to make a copy of her copy. And, and 
and then somebody else, uh, her husband wants to make a copy of the mother's copy for someone at work. And, and so we go down till eventually it's been copied 51 times. And then we go further down the line and we've got a hundred copy, a copy of 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 a cof copy and so on. Well, here's a question for you. Consider the master copy and the hundred copy of a copy of a copy. Will tape 100 have the same sound quality as the original master copy or will it have lost something? It's obvious, isn't it? There's, there will be a loss of quality in the copying process. A lovely illustration of mutations. Dr. John, Dr. John Sanford, a professor of genetics at Cornell, Cornell University, he wrote a book, uh, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. When subjected only to natural forces, the human genome must irrevocably degenerate over time. Degeneration. If the genome is actually degenerating, it is bad news for the long-term future of the human race. It is all bad, also bad news for the evolutionary theory. If mutation, selection, cannot preserve the information already within the genome, it is difficult to imagine how it could have created all that information in the first place. He's just confirming what the veterinary surgeon, uh, Mrs. Jean Leitner, was saying. I'll read that again. If mutation selection cannot preserve the information already within the genome, it is difficult to imagine how it could have created all that information in the first place. We cannot speak of genome building when there is a net loss of information every generation. James Crow, well-known geneticist, professor of genetics, he said this, we are genetically inferior to caveman because every generation uh, there is a loss of information. The second law of thermodynamics, also known as the law of increasing entropy. Basically put, it just means that things can only go in one direction. For instance, uh, you go along to the local uh, BMW garage and you, you buy your brand new car and you just put it in the garage and you leave it there for 100 years. And at the end of the 100 years, you lift up the, the garage door to inspect the car that you bought 100 years previously. Will it be in the same condition? Well, the answer is no. Even though it's never been driven, even though it's been under lock and key and sheltered, the tires will be down, the rubber will be perished, the rust will have uh, gripped the, the, the body of that automobile. And really, it's an illustration of the increasing law of entropy. Things can only go in one direction, that is downhill, from order to disorder. We can put it like this. In time, order decreases. Your new BMW over time will decrease, the order will decrease over a period of time. Albert Einstein, he said, it is the premier law of all science. Order to disorder. But evolution has a reversal of that, an increase of information. The law of entropy makes it clear that this so-called natural process that supposedly increases information utterly contradicts the laws of physics. So Arthur Eddington, astrophysicist, said, if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, 
I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. Roger Lewin, he writes, one problem biologists have faced is the apparent contradiction by evolution of the second law of thermodynamics. Systems should decay through time, giving less, not more, order. Jeremy Rifkin. Our consciousness is continually recording the entropy change in the world around us. We watch our friends get old and die, the law of entropy. We sit next to a fire and watch its red hot embers turn slowly into cold white ashes, from order to disorder. There is not a single biologist or physicist who can deny this central truth, yet who is willing to stand up in a classroom or before a public forum and admit it? There's the iconic image. You know, we've looked at that to start with, but we're going to add to it. That's the pathway to Homo sapiens, according to the evolutionists. So what do we need? We need a colossal increase in information. We need to get from this note to the milkman, four pints today, but none tomorrow, by typing mistakes that will lead us to the Britannica. Just a non-starter, isn't it? That illustration should uh, convince us, I'm sure. And all accomplished by copying mistakes. A to B. If the law of entropy means A to B is an impossibility, it is needless to speak of the missing links of the in-between stages of ape men. We inherit our mitochondria from our mothers only. In, 18, in 1987, American scientists took the placentas, the afterbirths from 147 women from five of the world's geographic locations and compared the, and compared the DNA of the mitochondria. The DNA mutates every now and then, and by computer analysis, they trace the changes back to one woman. They called her mitochondrial Eve, the mother of all living. I read a book every day here at home, and it tells me that God created man in his image. And then he took a rib, and he took flesh, and he formed the first woman, and he called her Eve, the mother of all living. We all come from one woman. Now this, th this study in the DNA came to this conclusion. We all come from one woman. The estimated rates of mitochondrial mutation gave an edge for mitochondrial Eve as 100,000, 200,000 years. This surprised evolutionists who believe that our common ancestor was an ape-like that lived 3.5 million years ago. But in 1998, surprise, surprise, a greater surprise, even disbelief occurred in 1997 when it was announced that mutations in mitochondrial DNA occurred 20 times more rapidly than previous thought. Using the new clock should have been a mere thousand, a mere six thousand years old. It fits in quite nicely with uh, Bible chronology. What about man? Well, in November 1995, several newspapers reported on an article in Nature. A study of the worldwide sample of 38 men looked at the Y chromosome. The study concluded that since Africans, Aborigines, Japanese and European men all shared the same gene sequence, they were descended from the common ancestor who lived 188,000 years ago. So we all, we, we, we all come from uh, one man and we all come from one woman. 
But the Times said this, there is nothing to suggest that Adam knew Eve. There's nothing to suggest that Adam knew Eve. What do you think about that, Adam? Well, the editor of the Creation Science Movement Journal, he said, they say that just one man and one woman led to the whole of the present world population, and they managed this exclusive feat without even knowing each other. And it takes two to tango, as they say. Adam, what'd you say about, oh, he must have been dreaming. We come from one man and one woman. Malcolm Borden, and we're, we're getting towards the end here. Thank you for your patience. He says, if a man, if man has not come from the apes, the only reasonable alternative is that he was created. However, the implications of such a view are unacceptable to many. I would contend that such objections are fundamentally theological, albeit subconscious and not scientific. See, what is man? Well, we've we started with this verse from Genesis. Dear viewer, dear listener tonight, take this on board. God has conferred upon you the greatest dignity that could ever be conferred upon you. You are made in the image of God. But secondly, my Bible tells me by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Our forefather Adam, he transgressed, he disobeyed God and he brought sin and death into God's fair creation. And so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. So you are made in the image of God as I am, but like me, myself, you, you too are a sinner. But thirdly, Isaiah wrote concerning Israel and their relation to Jehovah, but it applies to us today. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Our sin separates us. We who are made in the image of God, we who are sinners, that sin separates us from the God who has given to us life and breath. We're separated from him. Ah, but Romans chapter 5 would con confirm a fourth truth. Not only made in the image of God, not only a sinner, and not only separated from God, but God commendeth, proves his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, loved by God. Now, John 3, 16, a familiar verse, certainly with Christians, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, if, uh, and certainly in our English version, if I was to say to you of John three sixteen, what's the what's the largest word in that verse? And you, you would say everlasting. It's got eleven letters, I think. Well, I think I would disagree. The biggest word's got two letters. Not that God loved the world, but that God so loved the world. That includes you. Includes me that he sent his son from the glory of heaven to the agony of the cross, that he, the sinless substitute, might die for my sins upon that middle cross. I was out cycling one day, I came across this hoarding. I'd like to change it. Love is what? Forget those two crosses, they were two criminals. Christ died for our sins. And he rose again the third day. Let me stress this. Christianity is unique. Unique for many reasons. 
Christianity is unique because it boasts of a man, a saviour, Jesus Christ, who went into death and came out three days later, victorious. Death had no power over him. He rose again the third day. He did say to his disciples on the eve of his death, because I live, you also shall live. The final skull outside Jerusalem. Let's take a close look there, the skull. According to John's gospel in the Bible, he went out, Jesus went out bearing his cross to the place which was called place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. You know, a skull is empty of a brain. And men in their foolishness and hatred towards God, they took the Son of God and they nailed him on a cross at a place called Golgotha. But here's the good news. On that cross, he died for our sins, according to the scriptures. After dying, he was buried. And after three days, he rose again, according to the scriptures. Paul is writing to a group of Christians in the town of Corinth. And he goes on to say, well, he said earlier, the, this is the gospel which I preach to you, which also you have received. See, the message of Christ dying on the cross is not accepted by all. To most people today, certainly in the UK, it's counted foolishness. But to those like myself who believed it, I did it in 1973. The gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received. I challenge you tonight. We finish with this. It is the end. It's the last slide. Don't be hoodwinked into believing the nonsense of the first self-replicating cell bringing you to a point where you are existing right now, 2021. The so-called pathway of evolution. It, it, it is a nonsense. It is a lie created by God, given life and breath by God. You're a sinner. You're separated from God, but he, he wants you. He loves you. And the cross is the means whereby you can be reconciled to him. Well, I would ask you to receive it. I would ask you to believe this message. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation.